Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Is this going to be forever? It's a pretty profound question that it's not something I came up with. Actually, it's something that I first remember hearing about 2005. Is this going to be forever? Is a line from one of the first viral videos on YouTube, David after the dentist. Some of you may be familiar with it. It's been quite a while, though. David's probably in his 30s now. Uh, but at the time, when the video came out, he was a, a young kid that had uh, just been under anesthesia at the dentist. And his dad films him in the back seat as he comes out of the anesthesia. He's pretty loopy. He says all sorts of really interesting, hilarious things. And, and he asks this question, he says, Dad, I, I, I feel funny. Uh, and he's trying to figure out what exactly is going on. And at the very end, he asks the question, is this going to be forever? It's a pretty natural question to ask. He's never experienced that before. He doesn't know. And his, but his dad reassures him, nobody, it's, it's not going to be forever. Is this going to be forever? It's a question we ask when we look at, at the struggles, the trials we face in this life. Is it all going to be forever? Because oftentimes that's what it seems like. So as we wrap up our serious hope in the face of death, we turn towards our, our ultimate hope. We turn towards the questions of, of eternity. Okay, are, are the things that we struggle with now, are they going to be forever? And so I, I brought with me uh, one of my favorite illustrations. Many of you have uh, seen this before. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a rope. Uh, and uh, have this kind of represent our life. You know, so so we're, we're born, and uh, we, as we grow older, eventually, you know, we learn how to share. Some people that takes this long, other people that takes quite a bit longer, right? You, you go through life, you go through school, and, and you graduate, and you get a job, and, and all of that so that you can then work and then maybe enjoy the rest of the rope in retirement. That's kind of how we do life. And, and the problem is when something tragic happens, when something happens that, that changes uh, kind of the trajectory of our story, it seems like it's going to last forever. Maybe you experienced this just a couple days ago at Thanksgiving. There, there's a, a chair that's empty. We made a recipe, but it wasn't quite the way that mom made it. We experienced this loss and grief, and it's not just this Thanksgiving. It seems like, well, it's going to be forever. Every year, we're going to still have that same loss. Or maybe you're embroiled in some sort of a conflict. And things were great for the first part of the story, but, but now something happened, and we can't seem to get over it, and so I guess that's just the way it's going to be. It's going to be forever. Experience a diagnosis, a, a change in, in health problems. And it seems like it's going to be Forever. Well, I guess I, I won't be able to do what I used to do. Is this going to be forever? See, when, when this life it, it is our story, when this life is all we have, it sure seems like the answer to that question is yes. In fact, Paul begins uh, the verse right before our reading from uh, 1 Corinthians 15. It says, if in this life only... In Christ, we only have hope in this life only. We are of all people most to be pitied. If we have hope in Christ only for this life, th then all, all the problems, the burdens, the sin, the difficulties we face really seem forever. But Paul continues. He said, but Christ has been raised from the dead. His, the first fruits, his resurrection, means our resurrection. And what that does for us today is it not only gives us hope, it gives us perspective. 
The things in life that we think are going to last forever aren't the whole story, aren't our whole life. No, our time on earth is just this little blue section. We have our time on earth, and then we have eternity somewhere else. It's a hope that we're given in Christ. Since Christ has been raised from the dead, we're not made just for our time here on earth, and yet that's what we spend almost all of our lives thinking about. Is I really need to work hard here so I can enjoy this? When the reality is, we're made for something so much greater in eternity. The most famous passage in the Bible, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him would not perish, but have a little bit of life and enjoy retirement here. That's not the translation I have. Would not perish, but have eternal life. It's been the plan from the beginning in the Garden of Eden. Death was not supposed to separate God from His people. We're made for eternal life. The things that we experience in this life are not meant to be forever. And so if we're made for eternity somewhere, the question is, how do I get there? How do I experience this eternal life in Christ? If you look at our gospel reading from Matthew 25, it sure seems like the answer is, be a good person. Right? We have the sheep and we have the goats, and uh, Jesus turns uh, to those that are on the right, the sheep, and he talks about all the good things they've done. When I was hungry, you, you fed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. And they go, when did that happen? It's a rough paraphrase. And uh, Jesus goes, whatever you did to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did to me. Sure seems like the righteous are righteous because of what they have done. And he turns to, to the other group and he says, you didn't uh, do these things. You didn't do it to the least of these and you didn't do it to me. But notice that Jesus calls them righteous. He separates them before he says anything about what they do. See, the main teaching of Matthew 25 is not how good the sheep are. It's how good the shepherd is. See, it's not us who divide the sheep and the goats, the right and the left. No, it's our, our Heavenly Father. It's God who separates the passage begins, all nations will be drawn to him, to son who reigns on the throne, and he will separate. And how does God separate the righteous from the unrighteous? He doesn't look at their works. No, the, the criteria is those who are covered in the robe of righteousness. Again, going back to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have eternal life. Ephesians chapter 2, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. It's not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. No, those that are on the right, the sheep are not saved by their works. They're saved because their sins have been washed away in the blood of the Lamb. And that means all that is left, if their sins are washed away, all that is left is the ways that God worked through them to share that love, that forgiveness, that grace with the world. And so that's what he commends them for. Not because those works saved them, but because that's all that remains those that are on the left, they have rejected the forgiveness, the eternal life that comes through Christ. So that God extends that rejection then to eternity. But we don't have to wonder, well, how, how, how do I get there? Do I know if I've been good enough? Here's the reality. Uh, whenever we preach your funeral, we're not going to talk about all the great things that you did as if those saved you. No, what gives us confidence, what gives you confidence in the face of death 
is the one who has overcome death and who gives you his victory, his righteousness. See, we know we are made for eternity. We know how, how do we get there? Well, it's through Christ and Christ alone, through faith in Christ, holding on to those promises. And so that leaves us with the question, well, what is this part of the story? If this is what we're really made for, what is that going to look like? See, normally we think of it as heaven. We say, well, I'm going to be up in a cloud. I'm going to have a harp. Maybe if I'm cool, I'm going to get an electric harp, and I'm going to be on the clouds with all the angels. That's not how Scripture speaks of it at all. That's not even how Scripture speaks of heaven. But again, our final destination is not heaven. Our true home is the new creation when Christ returns and makes all things new, living in the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth. That's home. That's where we're going. So what does that look like? The reality is we know some things, but there's a whole lot we don't know. There's a lot of questions that people will ask about the new creation. They'll say, well, will I be able to eat my favorite food there? Maybe. We know Scripture speaks of a feast, and it's the finest of foods. You'll be fine. Will I be able to fish or, or hunt or whatever my favorite activity is? Maybe. We know that, that we will be, again, not in heaven, floating in the clouds. We'll be on the earth and, and we will be doing what God has set us to do, just like Adam and Eve in the garden. We're placed there in perfection to, to take care of it, to work, uh, to uh, care for and enjoy the creation of God. What will I look like? How old will I be? I don't know. We do know that we will be raised in a perfect body. All right, so be bald with a goatee, just like Jesus, right? That's, none of the pictures of Jesus depict him like that. I don't, I, don't, I don't really understand it. No, whatever we look like, we will be perfect, raised in a perfect body. Right? Will my dog or my cat be there? I don't know. What we do know is that there, Scripture speaks of, of animals in the new creation. Right? And, and so we know that there will be animals there. And anything more specific than that, God hasn't answered. So we'll leave it up to Him. See, what we have to keep coming back to is, is what are the things that we do know rather than things that we don't? And that leads us again to what is this going to look like? It's going to be perfect. In the perfect presence of God. See, the most important question is, well, what about, what about the pain that I'm experiencing? What about my grief? What about my loss? What about my conflict? What about those things that I carry around in this life? Are those going to be forever? Now, there's a question we have the answer to. The answer through Christ is no. No, death and injustice and sin and pain and death, all of those are not forever. They do not win. Christ does. And his victory through faith is your victory. That's eternity. And because of that, living in a life that, that isn't stained by sin, that it isn't broken from the fall, we may have all those other questions about the new creation. And I'll tell what I tell most people. You can ask Jesus when you get there. And the reason I say that is because when you get there, you're not going to care. You're not going to care because you're going to be in the perfect, full presence of God who will provide everything you need. The Lord himself will be their shepherd, our Old Testament reading said, and he will wipe away every tear from your eyes. See, it won't matter. Because for the first time ever, we won't experience need at all. God himself will be our God. That's what we have to look forward to. And that's what gives us hope as we struggle in this blue section that we call life. As we deal with pain. As we deal with difficulties, with trial, with loss. It's not to discount them. It's not to say that they don't hurt. It's not to say that we're not angry about them. 
We might be angry at God for who we took away, for, for whatever burden we have to carry. But our hope in the midst of, of that loss, in the midst of death, is not only that we don't have to carry that burden, that pain alone, but that one day we won't have to carry it at all. See, we can be mad at the God that took away our loved one, that, that, that didn't stop whatever tragedy it is. We can be mad at that God. He can handle it. But we also believe in the God who will one day raise that person from the dead. See, the time we miss with our loved ones here is nothing compared to the time we will have with them again in the new creation forever. C.S. Lewis describes this this great reunion of all who are in Christ Jesus as the beginning of the great story in which every chapter is greater than the one before. That's why we have hope. Because evil and and injustice, conflict, pain have an end. The kingdom of God does not. Sin has an end. Forgiveness in Christ, restoration, reconciliation, do not. Even death has an end. Resurrection does not. This world has an end. Jesus does not. The new creation will not. That's our hope. That's where we're going. So the question isn't, where am I going? The question isn't, how do I get there? No, we know where we're going. We know we can be confident in how we're getting there through Christ. The only question left for our time and earth is, who am I bringing with me? In the name of Jesus. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, Guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus until he calls you home. Amen.